Well, welcome to this episode of Sense Making in a Changing World. It's a special episode again as part of Urban Agriculture Month. So here um, at Sense Making a Changing World, we're collaborating with Sustain Australia, who's the initiator of Urban Agriculture Month. And we're having this series of conversation with people who are involved in different aspects of urban agriculture around Australia. So here with me today, I have uh, Chris Smythe, who is the Nas- on the National Board of Community Gardens Australia. He's the Western Australia Coordinator of Community Gardens Australia. And he's one of the founders and current treasurer, treasurer of the Murdoch Community Garden, which is based at Murdoch University, just south of Perth. And um, I just learned too that Chris very humbly said, oh yeah, I was just before recently the Dean of the School of Media at Murdoch University as well. So welcome so much, Chris, um, to our show today to explore community gardens in the world of urban agriculture. Thank you, I'm looking forward to this. So um, tell us a little bit first about the community garden that you're involved in, the Murdoch Community Garden. Okay, well, the Murdoch Community Garden Um, we wanted to establish to involve students and staff and local residents in producing food on on campus. Um, And in addition to that, um, we wanted to promote the idea of resilience and sustainability and um, self-reliance, I guess, as well, um, which were important factors and particularly for students who are short on money, um, often don't eat the right food, um, and uh, it involves them in a social activity as well. Um, But it's not a a kind of welfare arrangement. It's productive and creative, and it um, uh, people bring different skills to it. And it's kind of changed its focus from time to time, from uh, from one of... um, producing uh you know certain certain um items um just for consumption to putting on uh parties with the excess uh produce um to making preserves and that kind of thing that we can sell at a store start conversations within the campus and the community i would say is the campus community so although we do have residents from nearby um, essentially, the activities are focused uh, inside the campus. Now, it's a big community at campus, as it, as it happens. Um, and from my experience now with community, looking at community gardens elsewhere, the community is what you want it to be. And it can be, you know, associated with a block of flats or it could be associated with um, residential um, uh, you know, senior citizens um, uh, complex or something like that, or it could be the whole of a country town. So the community we have is, uh, is, is the university. I wonder, Chris, what was the initial um, impetus for this garden? Did it come from the students or was that, like, who was the group that said, let's start a community garden on campus and Look, what process did you need to go through with the university to uh, get it in place? Look, it, it was, there were a number of interests, shall we say, of, of different people. Murdoch was well known and still is as a, a kind of hub for education in sustainability and environmental science. It was one of the first universities in the ni- late 70s to have something called environmental science. And no one knew what that was. You know, it wasn't biology, ecology, you know, that, that zoology. What's environmental science? Of course, that seems strange to us today. Um, so there, there, there have been, um, there was a site that um, uh, showcased new technology um, associated with um, permaculture and um, innovations in uh, sustainable living, shall we say. There was a group also who were interested in food. So food culture, largely. Um, and, of course, like most universities, there's an agricultural or some horticultural or, in our case, a veterinary um, a department, a very big one. Um, so there were those interests in farms and farming and, you know, the, um, uh, the primary industries. So you'd see a cultural g- g- gathering 
Uh, those are associated with sustainability, including students who had associations, um, researchers, and uh, and there was a, a sustainability officer, and still is, um, same person in at Murdoch who kind of uh, helped um, push the the idea within the administration of the university. Essentially, though, it's a separate organisation from the university. Um, it gets uh, its um, water and electricity and, very, you know, its needs uh, supplied free from the university, but it is an incorporated association like any other small community group or big community group for that matter. And um, it's also a student um, organisation, so it's a, it's a part of the guild. So it's nicely kind of connected inside and outside of the, uh, of the university. Is there any connectivity between different, um, any of the faculties integrating it somehow in how they're thinking or what assessments they set or projects or anything like that? Yeah, look, the site is is attractive. It's a kind of little haven. You might know that Perth can be crispy at times. It's quite warm and dry. Um, and this, you know, the, the, the spot, the site is a little bit on the edge of the campus, so it's quite a walk for 20 minutes or so. It's one of the largest campuses in Australia, as it turns out, because it's got a veterinary school that's got fields and horses and cows and things. Um, so uh, it's a lovely green spot um, that was a that, that was a, a, a nice place to do some um, do an excursion or teaching or primary schools would come and have a look and things like that. This environmental technology center where we established some plots. But it had attracted over the years environmental engineering classes. So they would hold their work there to look at how, you know, um, how you can recycle water, how you can discuss um, solar panels, um, all sorts of engineering um, solutions to environmental issues. Um, their little weather station there as well. Um, but essentially it was the sciences that took their classes there and showcased to students and other visitors, um, primary school kids and other, other visitors, the technology and the understanding of, of um, uh, in the environmental needs of the world. And, of course, they've become very much more acute in the 40 years since that started. But more recently, we've had students from um, and classes from community development who want to come and see how an organisation like ours operates. Um, and the newly established food and um, food science and nutrition course come and have um, uh, classes there. But also, it's always been a centre for research, and we've tried to maintain that. So we've had um, honours students doing uh, communication um, projects, um, which is very advantageous for us. We've got a little website and Facebook group, and um, they've uh, been able to give us some some good advice on on how we uh, have a have a profile. Um, and also, um, we've had um, researchers. Uh, involved in community community development and uh, and still some environmental engineering. So, um, you know, a, for a, an example is a hydroponics setup. Um, oh, sorry, an aquaponics setup. So it involves fish and um, uh, and the growth of leafy greens, for instance. So, um, you know, there's at a university there's many aspects to uh, an asset like ours i think it's absolutely fantastic and i wanted to ask you whether you know of any whether there's a network in australia of within the community gardens network of gardens at on campus because i know that there's many of them but is there a connection between them do they talk well, there isn't as it turns out um and it, it i think they've grown in their own in their own way, and I think this is the same with you know they, they can be siloed if they're and, and universities are like that they do talk as I know um, about interdisciplinarity uh, and it kind of doesn't happen a great deal sometimes um, but a, a a site is a very good focus for people to bring their own talents and interests. And, and see each other at 
will work and appreciate that and see the advantages of working together. So um, it, I would say that um, there might be connections between, for instance, academics um, who have a, a, a specific interest and um, apply that through the garden than gardens themselves talking to each other. I think because they've probably got um, uh, different, you know, different interests and focus. Yeah, that makes sense. So who, who leads the garden? Is it student-led? Is it led? Yeah, okay. Yeah, so we, we make sure, I mean, it doesn't have to be, um, but we make sure that uh, the president and, you know, most of the board are always students um, put their hand up and there's a, it's a, you know, we, we try to have a, a bit of a succession plan because in dealing, in, in, in having students involved, there is a, an ebb and flow of activity. Uh, but and I was just about to ask you, how do you keep that continuity going? What is that, what is that way of working? Look, this is, uh, this is a lesson for all community guards and all community organisations, and I would say also any student organisation. Students are often at the university, invariably at the university, only for three or four years, so they're not going to be interested after they've left the uni often. Um, then there's the internal cycles of years and summertime when they get work, and then there's the sort of micro cycles of semesters and um, assignments being due and you can't get your weeding done in spring just at the moment um, because um, everybody's studying for their uh, for, for their assignments. So, and that's fully understandable. And um, but at the beginning of each semester, it's full of energy. It's quite exciting, and you know the word of mouth gets gets around. So yeah, we um, it's a matter of thinking that through, taking advantage of the moments when. Um, someone shows an interest. And I think like in any organisation, you want to be able to say yes to th their involvement, even when they say, look, I don't really know much about gardening. We go, oh, step this way to our garden. Um, because there are other things. I mean, I'm no particular garden. I'm not a horticulturalist. I make the jam, you know, the marmalade, and I keep the books. Um, so... I think that's a really important point, isn't it? That you know, there's these these gardens are often a place to grow community as opposed to necessarily just about the food. And it's about all those other lessons that that can take place there. Thinking about the bigger picture of you know how how this is helping to ground us to think about you know how we can be in the world in a more resilient way uh, to face to face the future to look at you know, ways of <clears throat> understanding ways of designing landscapes or designing community connection. And I wonder how much of the focus of the people who get involved in that are there because they're concerned about the state of the world or, like, what are, what are the motivations of people being there, do you think? Look, it's an interesting one. Um, that changes according to the activities you do and the type of people you attract as a result of that. But there are some threads that are always there, I, I think. Um, one of them is people, the students are concerned about the, their, the future of the world. It's theirs and they, they want to do something. And it, it's important that organisations and society can find really valuable ways of saying yes to that question and that desire. And in our case, it could be somebody who, you know, we get, shall I call them, and I think they call themselves nerdy people who, you know, wouldn't know which end up is a weed or which is a weed and which is the parsley. Um, that doesn't matter because they can um, blog on the site, on the website, or they can... Um, you know, fix things that um, that have that, that have always been a, a troublesome um, that we you know, never get around to. So, and there are also cultural connections that we that we can um, we can develop. But you find that often they don't value their own skills and networks. So we could say, "Oh, you know an Indian recipe," and they go, "Yeah, well, my grandma's Indian." You know, of course. 
well, what can we do with the limes? So, I mean, I take that example. Um, as it turns out, there was a researcher, a research academic, um, and she had a recipe that was her grandmother's, and we made, because we had tons of limes, um, so we made lime pickle um, from this um, northern Indian recipe <laughs> and a uh, family recipe. And I said to the person who brought it to us, I said, so what should we call it? And she said, well, uh, lime pickle. I said, no, no, let's give it a name. So she, 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 we named it after her grandmother. So that's what we produce now. We produce a, a killer lime pickle. Oh, fantastic. <clears throat> that's such an amazing story. I love it. You know, and there's so many different aspects of all of our foods, all of the plants, you know, parts that we don't even know that we could eat that we do when we start to connect with that. Um, you know, all the different cultures that are involved. But I wonder, maybe, well, like, why did you get involved? I mean, you're not a student. Like, what's what's um, a university yeah. garden appeal for you? What does, why are you? I there? do like gardens. It's interesting, actually. I do like gardens. Um, and when I visit other places, I, I like to go to the gardens, like botanical garden or, you know, the gardens around some historic site or whatever. I do like history. Um, so, and I've seen some really lovely ones, you know, around old churches and abbeys and things like that in various parts of the world. Um, so I, I, in a sense, I liked the idea. Um, but one of the academics um, who was involved in food culture and media culture, and you might think, oh, what's that? But you have, have a think about all the films that you might have seen um, and the food scene in that, you know, in, in, that, in that movie. And there's... There's lots of there's lots of them. Um, some are associated completely with food, like chocolat or something like that. But others, like say, oh, I don't know, Reservoir Dogs, has got a great restaurant scene. <laughs> you know, so the, the um, uh, the academic who was involved in this uh, was interested in um, how we can uh, make food more integrated in in the university and um it was that impetus plus another uh, as i mentioned another number of others who wanted to do the uh, environmental or the um horticultural side who got together and it was just minds who were thinking of uh, of the same kind of thing from different angles mm -hmm. and a garden was the solution to their um hopes yeah. So that's that's how it worked. I mean, I, I, in some sense, I probably put that together rather than led some cause with with a, an idea, an ideal in mind. It was more the sort of thing I do, which is yeah, enable others to, to, to you know achieve, creating the space or that fertile ground mm. where these conversations yeah. and things can emerge. What yeah. happens to the food? Does it go into the campus at all? Does it go to individuals? Yeah, it look, it goes, um, you, know, you know, as gardeners would know, it comes in great waves <laughs> often um, and and sometimes dearths. Um, we, there's always kind of leafy stuff that, you know, people can pick and take with them. We have a communal garden. So the way community gardens operate um, is usually in two you, you two general formats sometimes combined one is the allotment arrangement where people can hire a plot they can go into the garden they have to look after their little plot and they pay for that exclusive right to to do that gardening and that's very useful for uh, people who uh, don't have land where they live um, or just want to get away or want to have some level of connection but they want their own their own produce the other one is communal where everybody, you know, sort of decides what we're going to plant and gets on and does the weeding and then they take a kind of reasonable amount of food themselves. Um, we've never had any problem, not too many problems where people have been greedy. We, we, we've had situations where people don't understand what they're doing and dig up all the potatoes at once. <laughs> um, that's not so good. Or all the lemons off a tree once. That was not the 
cleverest thing. But it was ignorance. In it wasn't like well, let, let's take them because they didn't even take them. They just picked them. <laughs> so um, yeah, yeah, I, you, I you, understand those yeah. ones. I've I've been involved in lots of community gardens, and even here where I live in the eco village and have lots of woofers, and they, you know people go out and they think they're helping, and but it's that is the learning the learning journey, isn't it? Yeah, so it is. As, as a Western Australian Community Gardens coordinator, you've yeah. visited lots of different gardens. Um, I wonder whether uh, are there any outside of the Perth area, or are they mostly concentrated oh, yeah. there? And what's the what is the main sort of um, flow of them? I know in in uh, I was involved in helping set it up a lot in Queensland, and mostly they're sort of the community garden style there. Um, yeah. What is it? What's the what's the flow or feel of them? In, in Perth? Well, I've got to say, around Australia, it's quite a movement. It's burgeoning. I mean, they're just popping up all over the place. And I'll come back to, in a sense, what why that, that's happening. Um, but they, 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 there are some outs, well, there are plenty outside the, uh, outside the city. Um, I mean, in, there are many reasons why community gardens um, seem to proliferate within urban areas um, and that's partly because po population um, it's partly because th it's a way of growing food outside your house but not an hour away on a farm it's just down the way it's just down the road um, and they are very local there's no doubt about it if you see them dotted around and there's a map on community gardens australia website uh, it's actually the landing page and you can see the I don't know, 700, 800 gardens that we know of, and there's probably the same again, I would imagine, probably 1,500 gardens at least, I would think, generally. Um, uh, and you can actually see where they are and see the nearest one to you, you know, so that, and I encourage people to do that so that they can see how local, how community um, community gardens are. Um, but in, in country centres, um, community gardens... Um, are, are popping up, and uh, it, it they do fulfil a uh, a need and a service for um, for their community in many ways. So some have been set up associated with say community resource centres. So they want a site of activity, and a garden is a good one because in a way they they're going to have a garden, even if it's just a nothing on it you know just weeds and maybe a tree um so that and that might have to be maintained by the council or by the community resource center um so they you know they they use the opportunity to make it a place where people can come it helps with security you know like um you know uh vandalism and things like that if people own the environment around um an activity center and this, of course, you know, is, is well known back into the 1960s and 70s in big cities like New York or Chicago or something where to protect the community and to give it a sense of ownership and, um, and value, community gardens were established in precincts that in some cases um, were the subject of, you know, crime. Um, so food was one aspect of it, but security and safety and social engagement were, were just as important. I wonder, um, so, yeah. so, sorry to interrupt you in there, but I wonder whether the ones that you've seen around Perth, are they, are they fenced or are they not fenced? Are they open spaces? Is there that much sort of trust or building or how does it work in that way? <laughs> how do I answer this, Morag? Yes. <laughs> um, they... Uh, they're of all sorts, mm. and sometimes that's determined by the council. For instance, if I'm on council land, I know one council in the northern suburbs of, of a very kind of um, suburban area of uh, Perth, where um, the you, you can't have a community garden unless it's not fenced. Mm -hmm. So it's got to have community access in that regard. Um, most of them are fenced. Um, sometimes there's a gate, there's, and you just walk through it. Um, others uh, are, you know, well protected in that sense, um, particularly the ones with allotments, because there's an, pretty much an undertaking that 
your your produce is going to be safe not only from other gardeners but from the rest of the world in a sense and um you know you just get a a key or a you know a, a, a combination to the uh, to the lock at the front so it is a bit of a mix most of them are fenced though um and certainly where tools are kept and other equipment and things like that that needs to be yeah. you know secured and of course that means then there's a whole aspect to administration of this so it means that there's got to be safety the uh, chemicals have got to be carefully stored there's some um and insurance as well so you have public liability insurance in most cases sometimes that's provided by um in one case in adelaide for instance um the suburban areas um community gardens can get free insurance uh, for public liability um, for um, for their uh, for their garden through greening Adelaide um, but in any case they would need to to have insurance or be concerned about the security of their equipment um, so yeah they're, they're and sometimes they look like a they're exclusive or that they're somehow got a perimeter but the close when you get to it, you know, actually you 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 can go in and enjoy it. Um, and so it depends on how they're designed, really. Yeah, but they're certainly um, accessible. It's, I mean, you can't really have a community garden unless and call it that without accessibility. And we 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 proclaim this quite a bit about it the, the accessibility of community gardens. And I actually think we can do a lot better, generally speaking, in the sector in doing this in providing ways for inclusion of um, different cultural groups, of people with different ability um, and uh, be, be safe uh, safe places. Often they're a bit higgledy-piggledy and, you know, there's sticks and stuff. There was one um, old, old um, or early established urban community garden in um, Melbourne that recently got called uh, about two years ago, got closed by the council because a new team, I think, had come in and um, uh, determined that the place was unsafe because it sort of bordered a river, so there would be snakes, and there were lots of sticks and, you know, uh, posts and stuff sticking up. Um, yeah, well, it's a community garden, you'd think that. So the, there are... The, uh, that's only just an example of you know, different attitudes towards mm. uh, accessibility. And I think there's something really, there's something really wonderful about them not being too controlled and not, and having a bit of wildness. That there's there in a community space on our commons, we have an opportunity to generate something together. It's not like you inhabit a space that's designed and made for you and you just put the plants in because that doesn't really feel like you have engagement. So this play, you know, the importance of having that sort of sense of co-creation or that like this is our place, you know, we have some agency here. And I and I I think that that's been my experience anyway. I wonder whether that's been echoed over in your part of the Australia too. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in fact, a community garden in, in another state would be completely recognisable, you know, to, to a visitor who comes or knows of community gardens in their place. And around the world, by the looks of the web, you know, they, they look pretty similar in some cases. Now, there are some big different designs, like, for instance, an urban food bowl or some kind of urban farm is looking to do a different thing that they want food production. They, they, they just happen to be a farm that's in the city. Um, they, do use, um, they do use volunteers. They involve the community. They've got cultural events and various other things. But essentially their MO is to produce food for, for, their, for their community. Many other community gardens don't produce enough food to live on. Mm -hmm. um, they, 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 they just, um, uh, they're a, a leisure or a, um, an activity of some sort of physical activity um, and a social one as well, of course. Um, so, yeah, the, the, they do look uh, sometimes a little um, disorganised if they're, um, as you say, but I think there's a balance there. I think 
there's got to be some level of organisation because the reticulation's got to be turned on. You know, it's there's got to be insurance. There's got to be certain factors. It's got to be open at certain times. There's got to be some level of organisation and um, uh, planning that's either top down or even if it's not top down, it's organised by by a group who have a single agreement about how it's going to operate. And then you want to let ideas flourish so that it becomes theirs and it's not confined. So you, you, you don't want necessarily someone coming up with their own wacky idea about how they're going to um, reticulate a certain area or how they, or, you know, what kind of um, chemicals they're going to use. Uh, it does require a certain level of agreement and that co-design aspect of it doesn't mean that everybody appreciates um, the very many ideas and lets them get on with it. it it's about creating something together that, that, that can be one ideal or, or uh, one um, activity that they've all contributed to. Mm. So there's, that's, a, that's a balance um, about uh, people's engagement, involvement and appreciating that and a grand vision. So I think it's kind of a very interesting point to maybe stop and explore here is how to cultivate that sense of community vision, that sense of wholeness. Um, you know, I know that, you know, various community gardens often struggle with this interpersonal, like how to make decisions together, how to get that common vision together. What would be your tips and advice from your experience of being in the Western Australian Community Garden Coordinator position or, or even, you know, from the Murdoch Community Garden? What are your top tips? Well, I think the, one, the, the main problem that community gardens suffer from, and I think the same with any small community organisations, is that it falls that the activities, the responsibility often falls to a, a small handful of people who are the stalwarts, you know. And you've got to make sure that, that you've got some succession. If you've got 20-odd people who show an interest and you've always got people who are willing to put their hand up for events and activities and to be on a committee or to look into, you know, some new project or raise, um, you know, uh, be on an event coordinating committee, then, you, you know, that's, that's great and that's to strive for. But so often it falls to a very few who can get burnt out and then the organisation goes into a lull and then that that doesn't help with recruitment and satisfaction and, and it shows in the garden often as well. So um, there's got to be, I think, a groundswell, enough uh, of a population, enough people interested, dare I say a market, you know, enough people who have have, um, have the capacity or the the interest to be involved. Um, then once you've got a kind of critical mass of people who can get things done, um, is to have a balance of skills, if that's at all possible, but you can't guarantee that. Although CGA is looking to kind of um, have a, a program, hopefully in every state, where we can help um, train or, you know, skill the, the people where they don't have, where there's a hole in the, the capacity of an organisation. And this is very common. Um, in fact, we'd like to pinch a, um, uh, a, a model from Europe uh, where um, the community gardens actually have a, uh, an organiser kind of role, uh, sorry, uh, uh, they develop the skills for an organiser role in, you know, uh, a, a garden or an area or a district. And, um, and it's actually certified. So it's a bit like permaculture certification or um, any other skill development um, like a TAFE um, so that, you, that, that they can um, uh, do the people skills side of a community organisation. And, and this relates to community gardens. Um, I think, though, the attitude that, that, that fosters the best relations and the, the best um, activity is 
to have tolerance that people come with their ideas, they come with energy and skills, and I think the, the to have the imagination to see how they can contribute, even if they either can't see it themselves or have a a a, a, a mode or a plan that isn't helpful to the the, the general good of the organisation. That somehow, if that can be accommodated and fashioned towards um, benefiting the whole, then it's a win-win because the people feel, you know, valued and they've, they've, they've been um, incorporated or involved in the, organ- in the, um, uh, in the things that, that the garden does and everybody else um, and the garden benefits from the skills that, and ideas that that person's brought. And I think the greater the mix of those things, and that's why we should have young people in in um, gardens more than we do. We should have you know people from different cultural backgrounds more than we do. I think, mm-hmm. and um, uh, those things can be. There's no reason why they can't be developed and thought about when you're recruiting or um, providing information. Um, you know, to to generate a, another another generation of people who want to be involved in the garden. And I think it makes sense too, in that way, to to have multiple different ways that people can get involved in that in in the invitation. So that the invitation is about you know come along to a to a feast or you know come along to a cook up together or maybe there's music or maybe there's some art or something else like there's different dimensions. So the garden is almost like the venue in a way for the community to come and then it sort of seeps into people's elbows and knees think oh this is a great space I'd love to maybe host yoga classes or children's um, classes here or something else so that it becomes a a lens that you put on what you already do and so you bring your passion for your thing that you already do but bring it into the garden and that's sort of how I've found ways to be able to weave the thread of connection and to you know um, support that uh, individual agency of each member so that they there's that that deeper connection and it seems to yes yes I think I I don't think I've talked much about that side of things in the sense that a community garden is for the community and not everyone wants to join or grow or be involved shall we say but they would like a bit like yeah they but they would like to come along to an event, um, buy some jam, um, uh, donate some compost or, or something. And, and the same with um, um, organisations, you know, like, like businesses might want to um, you know, do likewise, they might want to uh, uh, provide or be involved to some extent and likewise uh, councils. Um, so... It's something that gardens don't appreciate enough, and we've been trying to push this a little bit in WA, is that they are assets. I mean, some of them are beautiful and very accessible to the community. They've got pizza ovens and places to meet and um, beautiful shaded spots for, you know, young parents to bring their toddlers to have a, you know, a, a little play group sesh, session. Um some of them have even got a kind of stage platform where performing artists could could do their thing. Um, and some have got really quite lovely kitchens where there's no reason why, you know, um, other community groups or families, for instance, couldn't come and use the facility, which is for the community. So that is, is one of, you know, that, that could be developed and thought about a lot more and I think we're too much in the weeds and often involved in the survival of the, of the organisation to think more broadly about its contribution to their own community. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that brings me a little bit to how community gardens do appeal, for instance, to local councils. And we've put together quite a, a, a list of the benefits that community gardens can bring And I've got to say that uh, I I recently had a look at my own council's strategic plan for 2022 to 2025 or something, and they wanted to green their their council. They wanted um, social inclusion. They wanted, and, and security was another issue in our area. 
And um, I was thinking, I was thinking, ah, oh, that's why community gardens are so beneficial. You know, they want people out being active. Mm-hmm. Um, they want the the mental well being of you know developing resilience and um, a, a sense of safety and and confidence. And in so many ways, community gardens deliver on that very cheaply to a community. And I think the more local councils see that. You know, some of their KPIs can be met for nothing or very uh, modestly through a community garden in knitting together the community and uh, providing lovely spaces. Yeah. I don't know why they don't do it more. I know, and it's absolutely, you're absolutely right. And you can look also at, at um, you know, state policies, you know, health um, agendas, okay. education agendas, ecological agenda so it doesn't matter which angle you look at you can start to see how by engaging people in this so I wonder I mean is, is are the councils in Western Australia supportive and encouraging and open and facilitate this or is there still work to be done and, and then maybe um, just sort of is, have you noticed more broadly across Australia with your in, engagement in, in the Australian network are you seeing a shift in this local government? Um, support of gardens? Look, uh, yes, there there is generally so. I mean, for instance, if you looked 10 years ago, there weren't as many, say, community garden policies in in councils or as many, sorry, you wouldn't wouldn't see as many councils now, then as now, that have a community garden policy. That can be good and bad. Uh, Just having a policy isn't the answer to things. Um, so, for instance, uh, I know of one particular one where the policy is very prescriptive and it, it then becomes just a terrible ordeal to try and get a community garden up because it needs to meet so many things that the council demands. Um, and they say, well, look, we're very supportive, you know, I mean, we'll help you through this process. You think, oh, why did you give us a process that's impossible? Um, and then others uh, sort of ha- are hands off. The best ones are the ones that are a little bit hands off, but provide five thousand dollar grants every year or something. So that that um, uh, is interesting, uh, isn't it? I think, yeah. I think you're absolutely right. And you know, I wonder what feedback mechanism is being given to councils about that. Look, it's it, it's one of the key relationships that community gardens have. There's no doubt about it because many are on council land, and if they're not on council land. The, the amenities or the um, uh, there are some aspects that, that that fall within the remit of municipalities of local government, so they do have to have good relationships um, with their council. And just as you you said, and I've said that there are so many aspects that community gardens deliver on that can actually be a little bit of a problem with local government because um, the community garden might have to deal with the parks and gardens department if they're worried about the reticulation or the electricity or something the community development people if there's you know a grant or some aspect that involves a cultural event or something the sustainability officer of the council um you know in 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 um, some aspects of their work and in some cases, uh, I've had to deal with the health inspector as well because I make the marmalade, and you know it's got to be um, they've got they've got to certify that the place where we make it is you know meets standards. Now this can be a problem, but the best councils often pull their um, communication internally so that the 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 community garden doesn't have to deal with four different departments and people they deal with one and then they talk to each other within we had a we had a recent event um in wa in perth um which was all about councils and um it was quite productive because the people who came uh there were a good dozen or so people from different councils um realized that they're they're dealing with the same issues as well so they formed a kind of informal whatsapp kind of network in their own so it was developing that now i think because community gardens are popping up all over the place that this the the councils need to um they've become more aware of the needs of community gardens and and also the 
the logistics and to some extent the liabilities, I think, of community gardens. And they need to balance all that and they need um, they need their officers coming from different kind of mindsets to accommodate um, a good working relationship with a, with a community garden. Are there any community garden officers employed by councils in WA? Um, no, uh, but they are. Um, there are sustainability officers who get this. The should we say the prime responsibility, right. um, or in some cases community development officers. So they 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 then, especially if they stay around for a while, and there's a lot of movement within within some councils, less so I think in the country. Um, well, that's probably not right either. Um, but what happens is I think you develop connections and just as any in any job um, uh, and, and knowledge and experience. Um, and th- those, you know, they're, they're valuable um, um, people to to have the uh, have the relationship with. So if I did. Is- I did. So I, I, I can answer that for one other for the. Uh, a group of councils in Melbourne, because I was in Melbourne recently, and I went to the open day of one in Altona, as it turns out, and I met somebody there who was, I think, on two days a week, and she was employed by the Alliance of Councils. So I think it was like three or four councils. Now, they couldn't all have a community garden officer, but between them, they could easily put on two or three day a week person. And, and this is what this um, officer was doing. And she was, you know, in, involved in in supporting community gardens in a number of councils. Now, that's a great solution to it. And um, I think that's a, a great contribution. And, and not that costly, I would imagine, for each of those councils, but they wouldn't have been able to do it alone. No, and that makes it so much easier. So if you wanted to start a community garden, you go and see the community garden officer. They link you into all the different things that you need to know, guide you through the process of how to get it going in your place. It helps to facilitate this so much. Yeah. And I, so I wonder what um, what are the directions of the national network in terms of helping to facilitate this movement going ahead? Or also, I mean, I remember when I first started the network with a group of friends, gosh, back in the 1990s, we were doing a lot of networking between, there was the American group of community gardens, there was the European Federation of City Farms and Community Gardens, there was the British one, we were kind of networking between networks. And I wonder, like, is there that sort of learning taking place across the globe as well? Because yeah. the movement yeah, is look, flourishing, it's, isn't it? It's timely, actually. Um, the, uh, the community garden gathering, which is on uh, November 5. I'm not quite sure when this um, session will be available to people, but is is in Melbourne, and it's got it. Its theme is international, so there's a speaker from the UK who's going to speak about uh, their experience with incredible edible, which people might want to look up as a um, urban um, food uh, network which started in the north of England in, in, a, in a town and now is all over the UK and, and uh, around the world. Um, and so I think there is a there is a community of people who is that is international. Um, and our um, president and one of our uh, and our, our Queensland rep actually um, have been on uh, different scholarships um, to travel uh, around and find out more and bring back ideas from elsewhere. So Naomi's coming back from Europe and America um, to to talk about and bring back ideas uh, from there. And um, Gavin Hardy, who is a coordinator in Queensland, um, has a Churchill scholarship and he um, he's looking at forest, food forests in other places, I think largely in the US. So, um, yeah, I think... The, their, their kindred spirits and because you know we're talking about the world <laughs> we're talking about uh, our environment I think it's naturally been outward looking and your you know experience with this and contribution to this um, it, it uh, sort of proves that that point about um, an international perspective that people can share so it one of the things that CGA, the Community Gardens Australia, is trying to do is 
to make sure that local governments and other tiers of government understand community gardens because people come with ideas sometimes based on experience that they have seen one uh, and then think everything else is like that um, or ignorance where they don't really know what a community garden is or they've driven past and it seems pretty hippie you know um, so they, they don't it, it, so it's about telling the story um, and one of the things we've been actually quite poor at and I only realised this because we made a contribution to the New South Wales Parliamentary Inquiry into food supply and um, uh, and production, is that we need to prove the value of community gardens. We say they're healthy, um, that they bring people together, that they um, uh, they, they provide safety and um, improve well-being, that they're heat sinks that they are organic, they sequester carbon. But we, we needed to put together the substantiation of that in scientific terms to lawmakers. And um, that was quite a job because it's not really been done before. So it was a good piece of work for us to build on to say um, the, this is the proof of what we say gardens deliver. And can people access that report? I think it's on our website. If it's not, I'm going to put it up very quickly. Okay, fantastic, because that is so great. And I was thinking too, you know, the fact that a number of these gardens, like the one that you're involved with in at Murdoch Uni, these questions of research and validation, like is the possibility of doing really substantial research at all these different universities where there are community gardens and a lot of people I know, even in in Brisbane, I would have I'd be supervising students of all different levels at the at North East Street City Farm, and there's so much research that's being done. It's and I wonder, is that being collated as well? Because I I would it was one of my laments all the time. It's like you'd come and do this research, and, and the community garden is giving all this sort of support for research, but it never came back to the community garden network. And I wonder whether anyone's been documenting that since, because there is a huge body of work that exists, but where is it? Look, it, it is. Um, everyone's a volunteer uh, in the organisation nationally. Um, so it, it does fall on, uh, on us to find the time to do that. And um, when we put together the submission, the, the, the submission was timely, actually, um, or the request for submissions was very useful for, for, for us to focus that very um, uh, task that you just described, uh, at least to take a snapshot in 2022, at least, and then to build on that. So when we do find research, it just gets added in or localised. So, for instance, when we were looking at uh, the, the basically assertion that when people work in a community garden, they eat better food, which we kind of know intuitively, we couldn't find an Australian study to that effect. Now, if anybody's out there um, who knows of one, I'd be very happy to hear it. But we used one from Minnesota um, from the, you know, from in the last decade, uh, but and it proved the point. But I'd rather have had an Australian example, um, mm. you know, peer reviewed, hopefully. Um, but even not, um, it would be a valuable contribution to the things we say. So I wonder if there's anyone who is listening to this who is thinking about doing research and they'd like to support the community garden um, flourishing in Australia and beyond, who would they talk to to find out what would be the kind of questions that need to be asked and need to be researched? Would that be you? Would that be... Look, I'd be very happy to hear, you know, to speak to uh, to, to somebody and encourage them, um, and partly because I've got a you know, an academic background, um, but uh, also our president, uh, Naomi Lacey, would be a good, a good contact as well. Um, and um, if, we, if we weren't the people who, in the, in the end, you know, became the liaison point, we, we would find somebody who, who was. We do have um, a, a, a relationship with Griffith University, um, to, they provide interns or they they offer Community Gardens Australia as a, a place where interns can come and do their community um, project. Um, and also we have informal relations uh, with universities in each state um, 
where from time to time they make contact with community gardens for just what you say um, to be a place where people can carry out a, 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 a finite or bespoke kind of piece of research. Mm. Um, but, yes, I mean, uh, it's, it's in a sense, it falls to us as the organisation to keep an eye out for those things and to encourage those and be the conduit. So, uh, you know, a discussion like we're having now is, uh, you know, hopefully might elicit um, that kind of um, response from um, from people who are listening. Yeah, great. Yeah, so please do get in touch with the network if you are thinking along those lines. And just, you know, as a last thought too, I, you know, you mentioned that you do all this work as volunteers and, you know, there is there are community garden offices that are located in different places, some informally, some as part of sustainable, sustainability roles, some that are across um, networks. It kind of feels like there needs to be some support from I'm not sure where for these roles as community garden national leader coordinator people who can this is the work this is the work it needs to happen I mean the fact that you're all volunteers and doing this incredible work is is amazing and I know how much effort goes into holding the energy of these things but I wonder where that kind of level of support could could come from and is there any moves to try and put this into place as a national body and state yeah. bodies even yes um in our state we're looking at how we can sort of fund a coordinator for various activities because we're at that stage i mean the movement is at the stage where we need to build the capacity of um gardens and to do that there should be uh, training courses and support and advice and you can only do so much by putting you know FAQs on our website, which are excellent, I've got to say, Wonderful. and you, you'd be aware of those having yeah. probably and written I'll, a few. I'll, I'll make sure that we um, pop all the links to all those things down below in the show notes as well. So Yes, yeah. but um, like I mentioned, the English or the UK uh, and uh, uh, European arrangement where um, the, the, you, can, the organize, you can go to the organisation to get a real support, not not just someone on the phone who can, you know, provide a bit of advice, but, you know, someone who can be seen um, around the place, who can advocate um, and um, who can kind uh, rep be truly representative. And we're at that stage now, I think, with the number of community gardens um, that, uh, that that's... Uh, that, that, that would be beneficial all round. And um, it might fall to, say, state governments. I mean, if it could be nationally organised in some way, that would be excellent. Um, and to some extent, project by project, um, you could develop a continuum or, con, you know, a, a momentum in the, um, uh, in, in the sort of administration of, um, of a network that, that becomes more professional. So I guess it's like how sports developed over the years. Um, and um, if the benefits can be seen, and I think they're pretty cheaply um, funded, to be honest, um, then governments could see the benefit of a modest investment and, and that would accrue um, many times in... Um, uh, in return for uh, for that contribution, I think. Mm, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah. thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today, Chris, about all things community gardens from local gardens, university gardens, gardens in the country, gardens around the world. Uh, I think this movement has come of age in, in Australia and it feels like it's it's just exploding in terms of um, where they're popping up and, and the resources that are needed. So um, I will be putting all the links to all the community garden resources down below, the maps that you mentioned, all of those things. We'll pop them in. There's, there's also a, a guide for how to start a community garden that's available. Um, what other things that people look for on the site that, that you think would be really handy for them? Um, well, events are good, um, so they can see what's going on near them, possibly. Um, and also uh, 
the fact sheets will also deal with other aspects of administration and some of those things that people feel um, are a bit awesome um, when they undertake a voluntary role or put their hand up to be vice president or treasurer or something. Um, so, yeah, there are those. And, and plus a load of gardening tips, which, you know, is, is um, uh, what many of the, the fact sheets um, are, you know, soils and, you know, various models for um, for gardening. So, yeah, it's quite a range there. And if anybody sees that there's a, a hole and says, actually, why haven't you got this? Uh, they should, um, you know, make contact through uh, info at uh, communitygarden.org.au and that way we can hopefully, uh, you know, address that. Yeah, great. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. And, it's, yeah, it's an emergent process. <laughs> yes, indeed. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, All right, Chris. Thank you. It's been a pleasure chatting with you today. Thanks for your yeah, time. Yes, thank you very much. It's been um, most enjoyable. Thank you, Maureen.